House or in the galleries during today's joint session. Today's ceremony will be broadcast live and house photographers are on the floor for any photography needs you may have. The speaker has granted permission to take still photos for a period of 10 minutes to Amanda Mustard from the Pennsylvania Capital Star, Dan Gleidert from Penn Live. The speaker has granted permission to take still photos for the duration of the joint session to James Robinson from the Senate Democratic Caucus. And the speaker has also granted permission to concurring that the Senate and the House of Representatives meet in a joint session today, March 7th, 2023 at 11 a.m. in the Hall of the House of Representatives for the purpose of hearing an address by His Excellency, Governor Josh Shapiro, and be it further resolved that the committee of three on the part of the Senate be appointed to act with a similar committee on the part of the House of Representatives to escort His Excellency, the Governor of the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania, to the Hall of the House of Representatives, ordered that the clerk present the same to the House of Representatives for its concurrence. On the question, will the House concur in the resolution of the Senate? All those in favor of the resolution will say aye. Those opposed, no. The ayes have it, and the resolution is agreed to. The clerk will inform the Senate accordingly. The chair recognizes the majority leader who presents the following resolution, which the clerk will now read. Resolution, committee to escort the governor in the House of Representatives, March 7, 2023. Resolve that the speaker appoint a committee of three to escort the governor to the hall of the House of Representatives for the purpose of attending a joint session of the General Assembly. On the question, will the House agree to the resolution? Agreed to. The Speaker appoints as a committee to wait upon His Excellency the Governor, Representative Steele, Representative Smith Wade L., Representative Marcel. The committee will proceed with its performance of duties. The House will be at ease as we await the arrival of the Pennsylvania Senate.
The Senate is now entering the Hall of the House. Members and guests, please rise. The chair recognizes the Sergeant at Arms of the House. Madam Speaker, the Senate is now present in the Hall of the House. Thank you. The chair requests that the Lieutenant Governor, the Honorable Austin Davis, preside over the proceedings of the joint session of the General Assembly. The President Pro Tem of the Senate, the Honorable Kim Ward, is invited to be seated on the rostrum. The members of the House and the Senate We'll greet our guests and then take our seats.
Members and guests, please take your seats. Members and guests, please take your seats. It has and continues to be the honor of my life to be my community's voice here in Harrisburg, to serve my neighbors from Southwest Philadelphia to Yadin Borough to Darby Borough, and for this chamber to make the decision to flip a page in history just last week to be the first woman to be Speaker of the House is an incredible, incredible honor. Thank you. Thank you. But I must say, this morning, I am so very excited that a former member of the Pennsylvania House of Representatives, one born in Allegheny County from the 35th District, who has always been a shooting star, a voice to the voiceless, who's gone above and beyond serving his districts down in the Mon. Another history maker is in our midst, and it is now the honor of the day for me to present my gavel to the first African American Lieutenant Governor in this Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. Let's give a warm welcome to Austin Davis. It is my privilege to be the first Lieutenant Governor to preside over a joint session to use these two words, Madam Speaker. This being the day and the hour agreed upon by a concurrent resolution of the Senate and the House of Representatives to hear an address by His Ex Excellency the Governor, the Honorable Josh Shapiro, this joint session will now come to order. The General Assembly will be at ease while it awaits the arrival of the Governor.
The General Assembly will come to order. The Governor is entering the Hall of the House. Members and guests will please rise. recognizes the chair of the committee to escort the governor, the gentlewoman from Montgomery County, Senator Penny Cook. Mr. President, Madam Speaker, members of the General Assembly, as chair of the committee to escort the governor, I wish to report that His Excellency, the governor, is present and is prepared to address this joint session. Thank you. The chair thanks Chair Penny Cook and the committee. Members of the General Assembly, I now have the honor and privilege of presenting His Excellency, the Governor of the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania, the Honorable Josh Shapiro, who will now address this joint session. Thank you. Madam Speaker.
Speaker McClinton. Hang on, stay on your feet. Madam President Pro Tem Ward. Leader Pittman, Leader Costa, Leader Bradford. And Leader Cutler. Acting Attorney General Henry, Auditor General DeFore, and Treasurer Garrity. Members of this General Assembly, thank you for welcoming me, our First Lady, Lori Shapiro. Y'all are real smart to clap for her. I want to welcome two of our four children, Sophia and Jonah, who are with us today. <laughs> Along with our second lady, Blair Holmes Davis, who joins us. Madam Speaker, let the record reflect there were some members of the Senate who rose to clap for Ms. Holmes Davis prior to the Lieutenant Governor standing up. All right? I also want to welcome our distinguished cabinet and senior members of our team, led by Dana Fritz, here today. I'm very mindful of the high honor it is to address you from this rostrum. I sat through seven budget addresses as a House member. In, sat, I, in fact, I sat right there in Manny Guzman's seat, in seat 75, for most of them. The last time I spoke in this chamber, it was from this very rostrum when Speaker Sam Smith invited me to deliver my farewell remarks on December 15, 2011. In that speech, I talked about our shared responsibility, not just in this building, but all across this Commonwealth to confront our greatest challenges and move Pennsylvania forward. I said that day, and I believe it in my core 12 years later, that the tasks we face are too great for any one man or any one woman to address, too great for any one legislator or one governor, too significant for any one political party or another. And it was Speaker Smith who taught me one of the most valuable lessons I learned as a member of this House. In this building, the Speaker said, the three most important numbers are 102, 26, and 1. It takes 102 House members, 26 senators, and one governor to accomplish anything. And as those numbers make clear, it requires a collective effort. And while we should hold firm to our individual values, that should not preclude us from opening up our minds and our hearts to one another to find common ground so we can deliver results that the good people of Pennsylvania deserve. People like Elizabeth Strong, who owns a hair salon on Liberty Street in Allentown. She traveled to Harrisburg last month to join me as I signed an executive order improving our licensing, permitting, and certification processes so it would no longer prevent someone like her from getting that small business off the ground. Because people like Elizabeth work hard, she deserves certainty and a state government that works as hard as she does. People like Jess Porter, a third grade teacher. Stand up, Jess. People like Jess Porter, a third grade teacher from Pittsburgh. Jess works hard every day to give her students the skills and the knowledge that they need to succeed, to give them a shot and open up the doors of opportunity regardless of their zip code. Jess just wants the Commonwealth to, to give a damn about her students and ensure that they have access to quality education and a safe, healthy learning environment. Jess is with us today as a reminder of the work we need to do 
to create opportunity for all of God's children. Their stories and the stories of more than 13 million Pennsylvanians, that should define the work that we do here in this capital. This, of course, is the People's Chamber. And I stand before you today as the 48th governor of the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania, humbled by the trust that they've placed in me and committed to repaying that trust by showing them that government can be a positive, productive force for good. I believe that in my core as I did 12 years ago when I said farewell to my colleagues here in this house. I left that chamber feeling optimistic about our future and I returned today feeling more optimistic than ever before. And I'm optimistic because the people of Pennsylvania, well, they've inspired me. And I have faith in all of us that we can do this work together. Seven weeks ago, when I took the oath of office, I spoke about the mandate that people had given us. They want us to reject extremism and division, and they want us to get real things done again. We have the opportunity to pass a common sense budget that speaks to their needs, that addresses their problems, that creates real opportunity and advances the cause of real freedom for them, the people of Pennsylvania. And I believe we can do that work together. Listen, this budget proposal is a reflection of our reality. Let me explain what I mean by that. A moment ago, I introduced the three people seated behind me here. Three history makers. Pennsylvania's first black lieutenant governor, Austin Davis. The first woman to serve as the Speaker of the Pennsylvania House of Representatives. And the first woman to serve as the President Pro Tem of our State Senate. Now today, today in this chamber, we are witnessing history for the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania, and it's important to note that we all share in that progress. But it's also really important to note that among these two distinguished women leaders, one is a Democrat and one is a Republican, and nothing gets done unless a majority in her chamber and a majority in her chamber agree. You see, Pennsylvania is one of only two states with a divided legislature. And lucky for us, we're the only one with a full-time divided legislature. Together, we represent many Pennsylvanians who also divided their vote. They cast their ballots for you, and they cast their ballots for me. Through their votes, they asked us to implicitly come to the table put aside the gimmicks and the partisan litmus tests and deliver common sense solutions to the very real problems that we are facing every day. And the good news is we have the flexibility to do this work because together with my predecessor, you have all put us in a position where we can make critical investments in our future. Taken together, the general fund surplus and the savings in the rainy day fund are the largest in the Commonwealth's history. And we've built our budget around a conservative revenue estimate. So conservative, in fact, hear me on this, that we are using projections that are three billion, with a B, three billion dollars lower over the next five years than the Independent Fiscal Office, a notoriously cautious group of economic forecasters. We are prepared to weather a storm should it come. And we can also afford to make critical investments for the good people of Pennsylvania right now. Investments that build an economy that works for everyone, to create safe and healthy communities, to ensure that every child receives a quality education, and to protect real freedom. And so now, let me show you what that means. Let's start by lowering costs for Pennsylvanians.
Many of our neighbors we all know are being crushed under a mountain of rising prices, most of which are out of their control. And let's be frank, a lot of it is out of our control as well. But that doesn't mean we shouldn't try to help them. There are some common sense solutions that we can implement to take some of that burden off of our fellow Pennsylvanians' shoulders. First, let's eliminate the state cell phone tax. In today's world, practically everyone has a cell phone. And being connected to the rest of the world is critical to economic stability, safety, family, and success. By eliminating the cell phone tax, we will save Pennsylvanians $124 million every year. That's real money back in their pockets. I remember the moms in Erie who told me that their cell phone bill with lines for them, their husbands, and their kids, it's their largest single monthly bill. They just need a little bit of help. And so my budget delivers for them. Second, let's expand the property tax rent rebate program for our seniors and for disabled Pennsylvanians. I see some things didn't change. Some people didn't know if they were supposed to stand up there or not. It's all right. Give me a chance. We'll keep working through this. You see, it gives a rebate to low-income renters and homeowners every single year, putting money back in their pockets so they can stay in their homes. Homes where seniors like Gaylene Makuska raised their families, lived their lives, and made memories over so many years. Thanks for being with us, Gaylene. Let me tell you about Gaylene. She's a mother, she's a grandmother, and she's a great-grandmother. She made the choice to start college at 43. After leaving, she then went on to earn three different degrees. She's an active volunteer who loves to give back to her community in Scranton, and she's living with stage four breast cancer. Gaylene's life has been full of family, full of learning, and full of community. The property tax rent rebates have helped Gaylene stay in her home. But understand, it has been 17 years since Pennsylvania took a look at what seniors actually need to get by. 17 years since the formula that provides relief to people like Gaylene has actually been updated. I think it's time for the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania to catch up. And so my budget proposes a significant expansion in the property tax rent rebate. I want to raise the maximum rebate for seniors from $650 to $1,000. And I want to increase the cap for renters and homeowners to $45,000 a year. Fi finally, finally, and this is important, I want to tie that cap to increases in the cost of living so that this Commonwealth never has to tell another senior, hey, sorry, you're out of luck because your Social Security payment went up, but we didn't act. Under my plan, nearly 175,000 more Pennsylvanians will qualify. And the 400,000 people who already qualify, people like Gaylene, will see their rebates nearly double. So in a nutshell, this would nearly double the number of seniors who qualify for relief, as well as the amount they receive to help them stay in their homes. I've heard... Listen. I've heard from lawmakers on both sides of the aisle who want to expand the property tax rent rebate because it helps seniors in every single county. 17,000 seniors in Westmoreland County, in fact, more than 14,000 in York, and more than 11,000 in Lehigh counties alone. Gang, these are our neighbors. Let's get this done for them. It's what they deserve, and it's common sense. And it's not enough just to help seniors and the disabled stay in their homes. We also need to make sure that people living paycheck to paycheck can maintain their homes. I've directed the Department of Community and Economic Development under the leadership of Acting Secretary Rick Seiger to move swiftly to disperse the whole homes repair funds, get them out on the street right away. In fact, 
The first payments are expected to go out as early as next week, providing much needed help and comfort for our neighbors. I look forward to working with everyone in both chambers to support and grow this initiative for many years to come. We need to lower costs for families, for seniors, those who are disabled, and folks who are struggling to stay in their homes. We also need to lower costs for businesses so that we can create more jobs, hire more workers, and pay them a higher wage. We need to continue the work that this body began last year, finally lowering the corporate net income tax. Pence Pennsylvanians used to have the second highest business taxes in the nation, making it too difficult for companies to grow and succeed, and more challenging, frankly, for us to be able to sell this Commonwealth. This year, my administration is sending a different message. Pennsylvania is open for business. We're going to make our Commonwealth a leader in innovation, in job creation, and in economic development. If we want the next scientific breakthrough to happen here, if we want our workers to build our future. If we want to plant a flag and say, we are going to be a leader, then we need to keep lowering the corporate net income tax. And while that work you began, while that work, while that work you began is critically important, it's my view that we need to speed up those cuts. So I ask all of you, let's work together to do just that. Just last week, I spoke at the Spark Therapeutics groundbreaking in Philadelphia, where they're building a global center of research and innovation in gene therapy that is literally going to save lives. A company born out of one of our great healthcare institutions and with the help of an early investment from the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. Very next day, I visited Astrobotics headquarters in Pittsburgh and saw the lunar lander that will become the first commercial spacecraft to land on the moon. Think about that. In just two months, a spacecraft built in Pittsburgh by the hands of homegrown entrepreneurs will travel more than 225,000 miles to land on the surface of the moon. Again, a company that this Commonwealth believed in and invested in, built by the brains that studied here at one of our premier higher ed institutions. All of us should take pride in that. Two sides of our Commonwealth, two very, very different companies, but one story of Pennsylvania's ingenuity and innovation. We can tell that same story about so many industries and so many entrepreneurs and so many inventors. Thanks to our world-class universities and research institutions, our bountiful natural resources, our skilled workforce, Pennsylvania is poised to be a leader for decades to come. We can secure that future, but to do it, we need to invest more in economic opportunity, cut through the red tape, and move at the speed of business. In my first week as governor, I, by executive order, I created the Office of Transformation and Opportunity, a one-stop shop for businesses to help connect the dots and give them the support they need to grow and thrive. Already, our Chief Transformation Officer has met with dozens of business leaders, identifying bottlenecks that companies face when they want to work with the Commonwealth, and coming up with a plan to streamline these processes. And that's just the beginning. In week three, I signed another executive order to transform how state government approaches licensure, certification, and permitting. We all know that our licensing and permitting process takes too damn long. Those delays... Those delays make it harder for a barber to relocate his business, harder to finish a major infrastructure project, harder for nurses to start critical jobs 
in our hospitals. Delays like that exacerbate the challenges that we face, like a lack of access to health care in our rural communities. We've been held back by bureaucratic delays and inefficiencies, but I say no longer. That's why I've directed Commonwealth agencies to compile a comprehensive catalog of all the licenses, certifications, and permits that they issue by May 1st. My office will then put a firm timeline in place for each application, and agencies will be expected to meet those timelines. And hear me on this. We are going to put our money where our mouth is. If we fail to deliver on time, we're going to give Pennsylvanians their application fees back. This budget also makes a significant down payment on innovation and economic development, like a 50% increase in the Manufacturing Innovation Program, which connects our universities with our businesses to find new solutions and spur on innovation. This will be cutting-edge research done by Pennsylvania students right here in our Commonwealth, like what I just witnessed at Astrobotic. We also need to have more funding to attract and retain businesses here in this Commonwealth. Look, we've seen what other states are doing, and we need to get in the game. The next time a company like Intel looks to build a semiconductor factory in the United States, they should be looking at Pennsylvania. And listen, whether folks in this room like me or not, the one thing I hope you can all agree on is I am competitive as hell, and I'm sick and tired of losing to other states. It's time to compete again here in Pennsylvania. We will compete again. We stand on the precipice of a major opportunity for energy and tech jobs, and Pennsylvania must lead the way, securing at least one regional hydrogen hub here in this Commonwealth. I want you to know that the Shapiro Davis administration supports Pennsylvania's applicants, and we want the future of hydrogen to come right through our Commonwealth. But listen, it takes money to be competitive. And so here's what I'm asking of you today. Believe in us. Believe in our workers. Believe in our businesses. Believe in our students. And make these investments so we can bring more innovative business to Pennsylvania and create thousands of good-paying jobs in the process. Believe in us. You know, when I, when I walked the streets of McKeesport with Austin Davis, he told me about his hometown. There's a lot of communities like McKeesport all across this Commonwealth, communities that have oftentimes felt forgotten, have felt ignored, have lacked real investment. From Village Acres Farm in Juniata County to a Latino-owned auto body shop in North Philly, I've heard from too many people from so many different walks of life who feel like the system just doesn't work for them. They feel like it's unfair. And folks, come on, let's be real. We know it's unfair. It's unfair that in rural communities, many lack access to health care, affordable, high-speed internet, and capital. And it's unfair that black and Latino businesses are twice as likely to be denied a loan. We have to break down these barriers and invest in communities that have been left out of our shared prosperity. It's not only the right thing to do, it's the smart thing to do because that's how we'll create jobs and grow the economy. I know that Mayor Matt Turk of Allentown understands this. Allentown is a city that is on the rise because he is building bridges, welcoming folks to his community, growing the economy, and making sure that government works for everyone. Latino families are moving to Allentown and helping create vibrancy and excitement in the Lehigh Valley. They chose Pennsylvania, 
Now we have to help them succeed and boost the local economy. That's the kind of work we need to do now at the state level. And so for the first time ever, the Commonwealth is going to put sustainable state funding into what's known as the Historically Disadvantaged Business Program. We'll provide... provide long overdue funding for women and minority-owned businesses all across this Commonwealth to support their growth and open up new doors of opportunity. I visited with Latino business owners in Reading who are trying to meet their community's needs, but they just need access to a little more capital. Just, just last month, I spoke about this with black business leaders in Pittsburgh. I want every Pennsylvanian to know that our Commonwealth values what you bring to the table, and we will take an active role in breaking down those barriers to progress and partnering with you. On top of that, my budget significantly increases funding for our main streets through the Keystone Communities Program. You know, one thing, <laughs> one thing I have always loved about Pennsylvania is that no matter where you are, nearly every place has a main street, and those main streets matter. But unfortunately, too many of our main streets, like so many of those I've walked with, so many of you, they lack the kind of investment that they need to help them thrive again. We've seen communities like Newcastle get hollowed out, but we've also seen what communities like Phoenixville can do when the Commonwealth shares and invests in their vision. We need to make those investments not only for our towns and our main streets, but for our farms too. Pennsylvania's agriculture sector is critical to our economy, contributing $132 billion a year, but it's facing serious threats. We haven't even yet hit the spring migration season yet, but poultry farmers are already dealing with high path avian influenza. And my administration has taken action. Under the leadership of Acting Secretary Russell Redding, the Department of Agriculture is working to improve biosecurity efforts on our farms and make farmers who lose birds whole. Pennsylvania is one of the only states with a fund of $25 million here to help fill the gap in covering losses from this terrible disease. And I want to put another $25 million into that fund this year for our poultry farmers. Our farmers and ag workers do hard, important work in challenging and sometimes dangerous conditions. And so I'm asking you to work with me to support them and invest more in our agriculture sector. You know, we have 52,000 farms, many of them passed down from family to family for generations. They need more access to capital and we need to open up more markets for them. Because when we do that, people have more opportunities to enjoy healthy, fresh foods from our farmers. There is a direct line between the work farmers do and the food that it sits on our kitchen table. And so when people buy Pennsylvania-grown organic fruits and vegetables, they should know they're getting the best of the best. So my budget includes funding for a new organic center of excellence to continue the Commonwealth's long tradition of agriculture leadership. This budget also strengthens the connection between our farmers and our small businesses so that more of us can eat farm fresh, Pennsylvania grown food. We need to support our farms and businesses that want to grow here. And so as we support our farms and our businesses, we have to help our communities thrive. But as we all know, as any employer out there will tell you, the foundation of our economy is our workforce, our people. And we need to make sure our people get a fair shot. And so that means breaking down barriers like I did on my first day in office when I signed an executive order announcing that 92% of our state government jobs do not require a college degree. I want to tell you, I want to tell you why I did that and why I did it right out of the gate. Because 
My vision for Pennsylvania is one where every resident, every worker, has the freedom to chart their own course and the opportunity to succeed. For people to succeed, we need to make sure they can earn a fair wage. Let's... So, so let's treat workers with the respect they deserve and finally raise the minimum wage. Right. Let me, um, let, let me state the obvious. $7.25 an hour is not a livable wage in the year 2023. It's not. Our minimum wage makes it harder for Pennsylvania to compete, and it hasn't been raised in 14 years. It's lower than that of 30 other states, including every one of our neighbors here in Pennsylvania. We are facing a workforce shortage and higher competition in the job market. Businesses get this. That's why so many of them aren't sitting back and waiting for us to act. They're raising wages aggressively from department stores to diners. So I am asking you, respectfully, to work with me to finally raise the minimum wage to $15 an hour here in Pennsylvania. You know, To me, I, I got to tell you, to me, this feels like one of those fights that has gripped our politics for so long that some people entrenched on the other side don't even know why they're opposing Pennsylvania workers anymore. Enough is enough. Let us raise the minimum wage here in Pennsylvania. And while we work to raise the minimum wage, we also need to protect worker rights. As Attorney General, I took on company executives when they tried to screw over their employees. When a major employer stole over $20 million from Pennsylvanians doing backbreaking work on our roadways, we prosecuted the largest Davis-Bacon wage theft case in American history and returned every penny back to workers right before Christmas. As governor, I will not let anyone threaten our workers. That's why this budget provides funding to hire a new class of labor law compliance investigators so we can make sure every employer follows the law and treats their workers with dignity and respect. And I would say to those employers who choose to lobby against this funding, I got a simple question for you. What are you afraid we might find when we investigate? When it comes to dignity and respect, all workers should have the right to organize and bargain collectively. And so hear me on this. So long as I'm governor, Pennsylvania will never be a right to work state. That won't be that won't be the only way that won't be the only way we protect our workers when a worker loses their job i know it's devastating and in the past this commonwealth has not always done right by them because when they needed us most our unemployment compensation compensation system failed them one of the first things acting secretary of labor and industry walker did was establish a plan to fix the mess We've already hired dozens of new employees. We're updating technology with the goal of reducing the backlog of people waiting for help. A year ago, that backlog stood at 100,000. Today, it's down to 33,000. Now, that's progress, 
But I need you to know I am by no means satisfied. We must do better. When Pennsylvanians are unexpectedly out of work, they don't need another roadblock. They need help. So join me in this. Let's invest in our system to provide Pennsylvanians with timely and accurate answers and support. We can't ignore the fact that it's hard today for moms and dads to get to work in the first place if they don't have affordable childcare. In any given year, over a third of Pennsylvania parents report that childcare problems impacted their job. And our state economy loses nearly three and a half billion dollars a year because of a lack of child care options. Right now, what's really holding us back is that we don't have enough child care professionals like Cynthia Thomas from York Day Early Learning, who joins us here today. Thank you, Cynthia. <laughs> Pennsylvania has nearly 4,000 unfilled child care jobs and 38,300 children on wait lists. If those jobs were filled, we could make sure nearly every child on that wait list actually had a spot. We have kids ready to learn, parents ready to work. We just need more teachers and professionals on the job. In order to hire those vital frontline workers, we need to pay folks like Cynthia a competitive salary and give them the benefits they deserve. That's why I'm proposing a $66.7 million investment in Child Care Works to give more parents access to stable child care for their kids. And I'll tell you what, I'll tell you what, while we're at it, this budget also invests more in Pennsylvania pre-K counts because we need to give our kids a ladder up and a real opportunity. So worker shortages are one of the biggest challenges our Commonwealth must address in the years ahead in order to be competitive and to have safe and healthy communities. Consider this, one in four nursing jobs in Pennsylvania are unfilled. We're short more than 1,200 municipal police officers. And we don't have enough teachers with hundreds of unfilled positions in our public schools. Nurses, cops, teachers, we all know how vital they are for our communities. We don't have enough. And if we don't act now, the trend lines show greater shortfalls. And let me say to all of you, who believe that starving government is the answer? Tell that to a kid who's crammed into an overstuffed classroom, the nurse who has to work a double shift, or the cop that is forced to walk the beat alone. That should be unacceptable to us. And this is a moment. It's unacceptable. This is a moment for all of us when we have to believe in people and invest in those on the front lines who are teaching our kids and keeping our communities safe and healthy. We have to invest in cadets like Hannah McCurdy and Jermaine Graham. Please stand up. Hear me on this. Policing is a noble profession, and good people want to do it. So let's just make it a little easier to become a trooper, a police officer, a nurse or a teacher. My budget creates a new tax credit to encourage more Pennsylvanians to join their ranks. Here's how it works. For anyone who earns a new license or certification in one of those three fields, or for anyone who has a license and decides to move to Pennsylvania for work, 
We're going to put up to $2,500 back in their pockets each year for the next three years. That's better schools, healthier families, safer communities. And that is what my administration is fighting for in this budget. It is my firm belief that every Pennsylvanian deserves to both be safe and feel safe. Unfortunately, for too many, our communities feel anything but safe. The moms and dads in West Philly who have lost a son to gun violence. The Latino family in York who came up to me not too long ago and said all they wanted was for their kids to have a safe street to play on. That's why I appointed Lieutenant Governor Austin Davis to lead the Pennsylvania Commission on Crime and Delinquency. Because this is the issue that called him to a life of public service. You see, when he was 16 years old, a person was shot on his block in McKeesport. He got to work bringing people together to make our communities safer. He knows the impact that violence can have on a community. Just last month, Officer Thomas was shot and his partner, Officer Sean Slagansky, was killed when they were called to the scene of a domestic dispute in McKeesport. Officer Slagansky made the ultimate sacrifice, protecting all of us. Our prayers are with him and his family, with his family and with you, Officer Thomas, who joins us in the back of the room today as you continue to heal. <laughs> Officer, all of us in this room, thank you for your service. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. The Shapiro Davis administration is taking action to prevent violence and stop this cycle of anger and grief that is swallowing up so many of our communities. That's why we're investing more funding into PCCD and following the leadership of the Legislative Black Caucus who have championed investments in violence prevention and community-based solutions. Thank you for your leadership. And I know that creating safe communities starts with ensuring police departments are well-staffed, well-funded, and well-equipped. It's critically important that as we hire more police, they be properly trained. My administration is committed to, and we will encourage police departments to pursue accreditation, our highest standard of training across this commonwealth. For many, especially in our rural communities, the Pennsylvania State Police serve as local law enforcement. They patrol thousands of miles of the Commonwealth's roadways and hundreds of townships and boroughs. That's the work that Cadet McCurdy and Cadet Graham just signed up to do. We need more people like them in service. And so my budget proposes enough funding for four new cadet classes in the Pennsylvania State Police next year under the leadership of Acting Commissioner Paris. That's nearly 400 new troopers who will protect and serve our Commonwealth. But we also need to ensure that PSP has sustainable funding well into the future. Since at least 1969, the Pennsylvania State Police has been getting funding out of the Motor License Fund. And it immediately, think about this, sets up this conflict between infrastructure funding on the one hand and public safety on the other, as it takes billions away from repairing our roads and bridges. We should no longer do that. That's why this budget
That's why this budget creates, for the first time, the Public Safety and Protection Fund, the PSP fund. You get it? <laughs> Secretary Monson came up with that. It's a budget joke, which will be a dedicated funding source for the state police that will reduce our reliance on gas taxes by $100 million each year for the next five years. <laughs> Think about it. Think about it for a second. This is a win-win. It's common sense. The men and women of law enforcement get certainty that their funding will be protected for the long term, and the Commonwealth gets to invest more money in our infrastructure. To many of our roads and bridges, too many of our roads and bridges are just crumbling, and too many of our public transit systems are understaffed. We must repair our roads and bridges and make sure that we keep up and ensure that public transit continues to be an affordable, reliable option for millions of people across this Commonwealth. You see, connecting our communities spurs growth, and it creates more opportunity for our people. That's good for our economy, and it's good for public safety. And this budget finally allows us to tackle both. Building safe communities also means supporting our firefighters and first responders. So my budget invests... Come on, we should all clap for our firefighters. Come on. Stand up for our firefighters. So my first budget invests $36 million in new money for equipment, training, and salaries to support and grow their ranks. They deserve it, and we should deliver for them. It is my view that the Commonwealth can't do this work alone. Our local municipal governments and county governments are on the front lines of the efforts to keep folks safe, and we must ensure that they have the resources they need. Here's one key example. Let me give you one example. Our counties run Pennsylvania's 911 emergency dispatch system. They field calls from our constituents when there's an emergency, and then they get police and first responders and mental health professionals to the scene as quickly as possible. Since 2016, as calls have gotten more complex and staffing shortages more acute, the cost of running our 911 system has gone up 23%. But the state funding dedicated to supporting these systems during that time has remained flat. So this budget recognizes the challenges counties and 911 dispatchers face and invests over $50 million in that system and then ties that funding to the cost of living so it will keep up with rising costs. I hope it's not lost on anybody in this room that every one of you represents a county. And every one of those counties relies on a 911 system. So let's come together on this. It's common sense. Here's another thing we can do to help our municipalities. They can't keep up with challenges like the rising cost of health care and increasing public safety needs because they're operating on these shoestring budgets. It's not just the 911 systems where local communities are feeling the pinch. In the past, when a local government struggled, municipalities then were forced to shutter their police departments and made cuts that undermined the safety and welfare of our communities. And we routinely saw that nearby towns face similar challenges. So listen, rather than having the state come in and take over local operations, how about we actually help these small communities band together and share resources and share know-how, combine services and help more people, alleviate the burden on the Pennsylvania State Police and other resources. This budget will invest in the Municipal Assistance Program to help our local communities support themselves. So I said a moment ago, or actually at the rate I'm going, it maybe it was two moments ago, people have a right to be safe in their communities, but folks also have a right to feel safe in their communities. 
As Attorney General, I had the privilege of seeing our criminal justice system up close as Chief Law Enforcement Officer of this Commonwealth. I enforce the law without fear or favor and pursue justice for victims. I also saw firsthand the many ways in which our criminal justice system falls short. I know Speaker McClinton understands what I mean. You see, before she got here, she worked for seven years as a public defender. Public defenders are champions of justice, ensuring every citizen receives the representation that they are constitutionally entitled to. They do that work, despite oftentimes being underpaid and under-resourced. Did you know that Pennsylvania is one of only two states in the nation that provides zero state support for indigent defense? Folks, that's not a list we want to be on. And that's why I am proposing today, for the first time, that we make a $10 million investment in public defenders this year and every year going forward. We also, we also need to invest in other parts of the criminal justice system that have just been neglected for too long. The probation and parole systems were originally designed to help people get back up on their feet and then stay out of prison. But that's not what's happening in reality. Pennsylvania has a 64% recidivism rate. That means that 64% of the people who walk out of our jails and prisons will go back many of them for nonviolent technical parole violations. The first step in improving this system is investing in probation and parole services to reduce caseloads, improve training, and enhance services. The more time a PO can spend with an individual, the more help they can provide as they look for a job, find an apartment, and settle in to a successful life. However, while those investments will help, it is long past time to reform our system as a whole and put responsible limits on probation terms. You. You. you all have passed that bill before. And I hope you do it again, and soon. Put it on my desk, and I will sign it. Finally, as a former member of the Board of Pardons, I know that too many people wait too many years to have their cases heard. So this budget includes new funding to clear out that backlog so second chances can come a little bit sooner. Listen, justice isn't only done in our courtrooms, it's also done in our communities. Article 1, Section 27 of our Commonwealth Constitution states that every Pennsylvanian has a right to clean air and pure water. And sometimes, sometimes, sometimes those rights are threatened directly by events largely out of our control. Since the first hours after that Norfolk Southern train derailed just across the border in East Palestine, Ohio, my administration has been on the ground in Western Pennsylvania, coordinating with first responders and ensuring Pennsylvanians have the resources they need to stay safe. We are so grateful for the hard work and cooperation of local and state officials from the area, including the chairman of the Beaver County Board of Commissioners, Dan Camp, who is with us today. Dan's leadership, together with Senators Bartolotta and Vogel, and Representatives Kale, Marshall, and Matsey, have been critically important. As we speak, the Department of Environmental Protection is conducting independent water sampling. The Department of Health has seen more than 300 people at the Health Resource Center in Darlington Township, answering questions and offering free access to treatment should residents need it. 
Nothing can make up for the damage that's already been done, but what the people of Pennsylvania deserve right now is accountability. Last week, Norfolk Southern CEO Alan Shaw came right here to my office to apologize, and I laid out what he and his company must do to make up for their mistakes. He heard me loud and clear. They need to pay for this, and they are. I demanded... I demanded that the company pay for the hours of work Commonwealth employees have done in the wake of their derailment. I demanded they pay to replace damaged or contaminated equipment from local fire departments who responded that night. I looked him right in the eye and told him that the good people of Beaver and Lawrence counties deserve better and they need at least that million dollar community relief fund to make up for their loss. And now that is exactly what Norfolk Southern has committed in writing to do. They are gonna make our people whole. This is a floor, not a ceiling for what they need to do. Listen, folks, these are real people. Like Emily from Darlington Township, who I spent time with in her home, she evacuated her home and had to throw out hundreds of dollars of food and all of the eggs that her chickens had laid. Like the small business owners who had to miss a day of work or lost customers due to the derailment. All of that will now come out of Norfolk's Southern's pocket. And I want to be crystal clear, this is a floor, not a ceiling, for what Norfolk Southern will owe the good people of Western Pennsylvania. My administration will continue to do everything in our power to protect Pennsylvania. We will be there as long as it takes, working together with our partners. But it's not enough just to respond to this crisis. We also need to protect our communities and safeguard our natural resources before disaster strikes. That's why my administration is acting
As we invest in public health and safety and wellness, we should be stopping
I introduced earlier, who worked hard to continue to serve in their communities. They've earned the right to live out their golden years with dignity. For so many seniors, Pennsylvania's AAAs provide critical support. How seniors access health care transportation and public benefits that they earn? But as AAAs are so thin, able to serve a growing population of seniors, this is so critically important that I put a former AAA leader, Acting Secretary Coolidge, in charge of the Department of Aging. This budget makes a significant investment in AAAs all across the Commonwealth so we can ensure seniors get the services they deserve and that what they need to be able to stay in their homes.
to Mr. Humphrey to make mental health parity a true reality here in Pennsylvania. And hold and scores down so mental health benefits are covered fairly. For mental health care is a special institute for school children. I started with a statistic in a non typical system to be able to report violence and threats of violence. Since we launched the program five years ago, we received over 100,000 tips. But you know what? Most of the tips weren't about violence. 75% of those tips were from kids reaching out with mental health issues for themselves and their friends. In their schools, I've asked the students what they need. Let me give you a few examples of me. I said earlier, we are going to 
provide universal free benefits to schools. Students can earn empty stocks. We're going to have to have a million dollars for the next five years for environmental repairs and upgrades to our schools. <laughs> Students are going to have world class facilities that are safe and healthy, and this budget is an initial investment for us there. Of course, none of this will work if we don't have enough well qualified, well paid teachers in our classrooms. So we are going to give our new teachers a tax break and more tours in their classrooms so they can help students succeed. Our schools should prepare students for the future and give them the freedom to start their own course. If they want to go to college, make it more affordable. If they want to go straight to the workforce, we should make sure they have the skills and opportunities to provide for the family. You know, 22 years ago, Pennsylvania invested over $200 a year in education. Legal education. People call it PT. Last year, we spent less than half of that on our own people. As a result, students have the opportunity to do a job in the trades. Few know that path even exists. And a partnership fast back to a good school. should have the opportunity to follow Freddie's path. My administration has a comprehensive plan to invest in ownership programs, expand OTEP, bring career and technical education back into our Pennsylvania classrooms. Yes. Right all. We can connect the dots between our schools, our trade unions, our companies, and the public sector. We can create a pipeline from the classroom to the workforce and give Pennsylvanians the tools that they need to succeed, where they can choose their own course. They achieve real freedom. Our commitment to our students, workers, and friends is compromised. This invests in them and in their safety. For those who choose to pursue college, I think it's on us to read our system of higher education. Because what we are doing right now is not working. Think about it. Colleges are competing with one another for a living dollar. in our party communities. As enrollment declines, questions about the value of college degree persist. It's on all of us to once and all have an honest dialogue about higher education in Pennsylvania. And so, so I've tasked the Secretary Dean to immediately convene our college and university presidents to pick up on the conversation I've already started with them. Agree to engage in a constructive, time limited working group. So when I stand before you next year, I can present a comprehensive and meaningful reform plan for higher education. I hope you join me in the report.
And in the meantime, in the meantime, this budget real investments community colleges, technical schools. It takes real resources for the system, state relations, keep whole federal training. But it is time for a blueprint for higher education, focus on competitiveness and workforce development and granted in access and affordability. That Keep the doors of opportunity open for generations to come. Look, if you take one thing away from this address, please let it be this. The budget is packed with consent solutions to problems that the people of Pennsylvania face every single day. We have significant opportunities over this year and a half to work together to pass the budget that the Federal Reserve has always present problems. But let's focus on that. Because look, we all know that there's a debate that will go nowhere with me. As I'm there, this will never be a work to work state. As long as I'm going, LGBTQ will have the right. Discrimination law, Pennsylvania law. Because our will will always have the right to choose and access to abortion and all productive health. As long as I'm under the right to vote, will never infringe upon. For me. Instead of arguing about that, instead of focus on this budget, let's focus on the challenges that seek to address. Put forth a vision that I think Pennsylvania can be. This budget lowers costs, cuts taxes, and so forth. It cuts red tape and speaks of permanent and support business, strengthens our communities, and strives to keep us safer and more just. It protects our environment, invests in public health, and starts a long process of making our education system more fair. Every child in this commonwealth has a share. It's common sense. Government can and should be a force for good in our lives. We can do big things together. We just work again together. You know, I know there's a time on tradition in this body, that as soon as the guy finishes his budget address, some 203 House members, 50 candidates, right out that door to find the new TV camera and back to the government. He saw even break that. And I'm not the same who do just that. But I think the people in Pennsylvania, I think to expect more from us, more than just the traditional politics. As I said at the beginning of my address, they entrusted us with responsibility to negotiate and come to it. Instead of playing politics as usual, show the people in Pennsylvania that we are up to the task. Let's just run out of here. Let's head around the table and work on common solutions for their problems. People are playing to deserve it, and I look forward to doing that work with you. God bless you. God bless you, fellow Pennsylvania. May God watch over the win and win of Pennsylvania National Park.